All right, so first question is actually pretty convenient considering last uh, last night the DC Council passing the Omnibus Public Safety Bill. So I've got to ask, what role did the escalating DC crime have on the decision to move to Virginia? Very little. Um, first, I believe in the mayor and that they're going to take very, very seriously the reimagination of DC. And, um, and I think the crime, city council, mayor, police force, they'll get it right. And big cities have a lot of crime. Um, but I have called for <clears throat> an integrated look at how will we turn the city around. And it's not just us. It has to be uh, the mayor, the city council, the federal government, the teachers union, uh, the school system. I mean, it just goes on and on. And I see every part of the city through my work in philanthropy, through the work with my venture funds here, uh, to, through Georgetown University. And it's going to take a village to turn this around. Um, I think the crime will get, as the new laws get rolled out, as the police force gets re-established, refunded, uh, I think that crime will come down. And we'll get back to DC, but I'll, I'll get moved to Virginia because there's a lot of steps in this process. And I know we've heard uh, criticism from, you know, some some state lawmakers that are not very close to Alexandria. So what would your response be to taxpayers that won't be close to this new stadium that say, why should we pay our tax dollars for the stadium for something we might not get benefit for? Um, if somebody was paying their tax dollars, they would not understand um, what this arrangement is about. Um, this is a agreement between us and the state. Um, they will use their balance sheet to get lower interest rates, and we will pay that. Just like we are paying a bank today on our mortgage on the building, and we are paying taxes on our tickets that go to the city, those same efforts, instead of paying a mortgage, will be paying a fee to pay down the bonds. Instead of paying a tax to the city, it'll go to pay down the bond. And so I think the governor has arranged for a very, very innovative, straightforward deal that has very little risk in it to the state, but has unbelievable upside. And I think that those dollars, the profits, if you will, from the community will be going down to other areas. And so I think they will be uh, recipients of the revenues, the dollars that we're generating in Virginia. And I want to get a little bit to the process because this still needs to be approved in the uh, the Virginia General Assembly. Governor Youngkin's going to need a lot of help from the other side of the aisle with Democrats controlling both chambers. Uh, if this, are you concerned that Virginia lawmakers may not approve the funding this legislative session? And if that doesn't happen, are you willing to wait for the next session? Would you, you know, t you know, take up more of the the bill on the stadium? And if this falls through, what's next? Well, that, that's kind of the beauty of the situation that we're in. I have a building mm -hmm. that I own, and we would just play here. And, but we're all fixated on what's the future going to be, and to have this 70-acre parcel of land, 12 acres to start just for us, where we can imagine what the next generation of a arena is, have a music arena next to it, have the practice facility there. In Virginia, there's not the height restrictions that we have in DC. We'll be able to take our employee base, which is very large and growing, and put them all in one building. Here they're in five different buildings that'll uplift our culture and our performance. Uh, to be able to program um, the experience before the game and after the game, be responsible for what dining there is, what shopping there is. Um, and I intend to build a family-friendly, fan-friendly, um, from when you start to go to the arena to when you leave, to program all of that. You know, I've heard criticism about traffic. No one hates traffic more than me. No one obsesses on traffic more than me. I've taken the route now from my home in Potomac to Potomac Yards. I live in Potomac, Maryland. And if you go, later in the afternoon against traffic, um, even with all of the construction that's on the GWP, 
that'll be done in 2025. It's eight minutes quicker to go from my house to Potomac Yards than it is to get here. So you have to go cross the city. One, I took K Street today. That wasn't a fun trip. You know why it's not a fun trip? It wasn't designed to be a thoroughfare. They have to do work on K Street. They have to sink the lights. They have to get rid of those little islands. Yeah. And But that's a small thing to do if you're committed to fixing a problem. And I heard criticism yesterday about the metro stop. Yeah. And I said, well, the... The Washington Nationals, the city built a stadium three blocks away. I'm a season ticket holder. I take the metro there. That station is the exact same size as the metro station in Potomac. The exact same length will accept the exact same amount of cars. But that stadium is twice as big as our arena. And they said, well, we can't have that. We'll have to add more escalators and more elevators and more entranceways. That's how they uplifted that. Okay, we'll do the same in Potomac. We'll have a walkway to get into the arena. It'll be twice as big. Um, but these are not problems that aren't foreseen or, and opportunities that you can't just focus time, attention, and dollars to get it fixed. And so. I hope that we will be a part of the solution to traffic problems. Uh, we'll be part of the solution to a lot of the quality of life problems. We're not going to be additive. Mm -hmm. And when you get down to the number of games that we have on weekdays <clears throat> and the number of trips associated with it, here we have 200 parking spots. There'll be 2,500 parking spots mm -hmm. right on the campus that you can walk to. We'll work very closely with the, <coughs> excuse me, the Ubers and the Lyfts. Uh -huh. I'm here, Uber and Lyfts are having to drop people off further and further away because it's a busy city and there's red lights and mm -hmm. there's street closures. And, um, and so the ability to control and program the environment in that 70 acres, there's nothing there now. We want to lay and work with JBG, our partner, to create the smartest grid. Now, why is that important? Well, you need the data. You need to be able to know when do people actually arrive? When are they leaving? How did they arrive? Uh -huh. We have all of that data from here, and we will apply that so that we have smart decisions, synced lights. The lights only have to be synced when people are arriving and leaving, and then they can be programmed for the rest of the city. So we'll be additive to the quality of life. I remember watching on your station a woman uh, at the announcement said, um, I live a half a block away from here, and this is a, a terrible thing for our neighborhood. And I would agree, um, but the neighborhood is a mile away, mm -hmm. and you won't be able to see today when you drive Route 1, you can't see the site, you mm -hmm. can't see Virginia Tech. You won't be able to see our building. We'll be really, really sensitive and great neighbors. Uh -huh. But I also want to build a beautiful, iconic building. Uh -huh. I think it's very, very important because iconic real estate helps to define a community. And, and you know, this will be a billion and a half dollar building. Uh -huh. It'll create union jobs. We're a union shop today. There are 1,500 union employees today working in this building uh -huh. to support the basketball game. Um, good paying jobs, great benefits. We pay a lot of taxes. We're probably the largest taxpayer in downtown. Uh -huh. uh, we're popular. When I hear um, arenas and teams don't add any economic value to a community. I go, well, someone better call Wes Moore and tell him that because they built the Raven Stadium, they built the Oriole Stadium, and now they just gave each of those owners $600 million each, a billion two, to upgrade their stadiums and build around it. Uh -huh. That's Maryland. That's where I live. Uh -huh. okay? And they tax liquor and the lottery and the casino gambling and the like. Uh -huh. Someone had a better call our mayor because to get the baseball team here, 
they had to pay $600 million to stand up the stadium, plus take funds from elsewhere to do the roads, the turnoffs, and the like. Mm -hmm. And the Lerner family paid $400 million for the team. So it's over a billion dollars that baseball valued that at. Yep. What's the most important, fastest growing area in D.C.? The Navy Yard, mm -hmm. where the stadium is. Mm -hmm. Well, and I want to get to the popularity. You talk about the growth in these neighborhoods where these these teams yeah. are, but you know, uh, the night before you uh, you and Governor Yunkin held your press conference, Mayor Bowser uh, announced that there was a five hundred million dollar renovation uh, bill that had unanimous support from council. You know, are you using Alexandria possibly as leverage to no. get as much mo money as Absolutely possible? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Well, is DC still in the running to keep the the team here, or is that a done deal? If it's approved in Virginia, we're moving to Virginia. Um, absolutely. And, you know, when Potomac Yard first leaked to the media, do you think Mayor Bowser was taken by surprise by that? Did she contact you or Monumental Sports uh, before the official announcement was made at Potomac Yard? And if she did, what was that conversation like? The mayor's been a, a great, great partner. And again, you know, in sharing empathy. Um, Virginia's a state. It's got nine million people. It has a huge budget. Uh, Maryland is a state and it has a huge budget, seven million people. DC's got 600,000 people and a much smaller budget. And, and so I think the mayor accorded herself really, really well. Uh, I'll remind you, we're the only organization that isn't beholden to a city, to a, to a state, we never received any money. Mm. I've never gotten money from the city for Capital One Arena. I own it, I pay the mortgage, I pay the taxes. In fact, when Nationals Park was stood up and built, the city did a tax on every business in the city, including mine. I pay a tax every year to the city just for the stadium fund. And then they said to the nationals, you have to pay us 10% in ticket tax. We were paying 5.5%. And the city came to us and said, you now have to pay a 10% tax. So they raised the tax to us to 10%. I couldn't pass that on to our customers. Hmm. So we, in a way, have been paying a piece of what the city um, has to do to support Nationals Park. And that's what you do when you're in business here. And um, so I don't think the mayor's done anything wrong. Um, the $500 million offer, um, the city should go and pass it. I mean, that would be a great thing for the city to do. I don't have any details on what the bill is. How, how are they paying it back? Are, are they raising taxes? Are they taxing anybody? You have to wait to see the final bill. I know what the bill will be in Virginia. I'm paying it, mm. right? So, so all we're doing is using they're gonna, the stadium authority be created, and they will create a bond, and we will pay what the interest on the bond is. And because they're a huge, very successful state, their interest rate is much lower. Mm. That, that's how this deal becomes economically viable for everyone. If you're a commercial real estate developer or you're someone like me in business and you go to a bank today, you have to put down a big down payment and maybe you'll pay seven, eight, could be if they don't like your balance sheet and your income statement, 10%. But let's just say it's 8%. If you use someone else's balance sheet and you're paying them back, they might get it at 3%. The difference between 3% and 8%, that 5% spread yeah. on $2 billion or a billion dollars is significant dollars. We, you wouldn't be able to do it if you were paying the 8%. That's how companies get in trouble. Mm -hmm. We have the cleanest balance sheet of any of the sports organizations. We have the least amount of debt and the most revenue. Commanders. Nationals, Orioles, Ravens. Uh -huh. 
So we, we run a really, really good business that's very under leveraged. Uh -huh. And you know, well, this is a deal that's very, very affordable with, with very little risk. Well, to that end, um, I believe according to the DC CFO, I think there's still about $34 million uh, in debt for Capital One Arena. I think that uh, taxpayers might be on the hook for. Uh, no, you... but that deal wasn't done with me. Right. But Mr. Poland, Mr. Poland did that deal the same year that the Nationals sure. came in. And so, but I've been servicing that, paying that debt, and, and the city did that deal with previous owners, yeah. and in it, they said, we want to negotiate a 10-year extension, uh -huh. but if you pay it off, it's done. Uh -huh. And so in 2027, that's why, in essence, we're a free agent, if you will. Okay. We just have to pay off that $35 million. Well, that was, that was my question for if, if that wasn't paid off, would. I mean, would you be on the hook for that, or would taxpayers be on the hook for that, that $35 million? I have to pay it off. Okay. Yeah, and <laughs> I, w I, wish I, could, I wish I could negotiate it, but mm -hmm. someone else made that commitment, and I would pay it off. Yeah. You mentioned the popularity of, of the Wizards and Capitals in and, and this downtown area. Uh, you know, there are a lot of fans upset with the decision to, to move away from D.C. to move to Virginia. What do you want to say to them? What do you want to say to the D.C. business owners who may be uh, really – struggling with this decision? Uh, well, first and foremost, my constituency is not local DC businesses. Uh, my constituencies are our fans, our players, our employees. That, I mean, that's, that's who I serve at their behest. And I believe that I can provide better services, better sight lines, better technology, better pre-game, post-game, better viewing areas, more interactivity, uh, more programmed game day experience to our fans, and they'll love it. Mm -hmm. Now, change is always very, very hard. I, I totally understand that, and I know that's the risk that we've taken, but my belief is that we have the resources, the listening mechanisms to be able to do a best in class for the fans. For the players, to a person, they understand and they love it, and they're demanding more from us. There's only so much we can do here because of the space. Uh -huh. um, you know, we were voted the worst media accommodations um, in the league. Uh -huh. That didn't feel good. The media voted on that. Why? We don't have any more space to be able to do it, and there's more media, more bloggers, more people coming and so um, just to be able to have the more space to go to every constituency say you know your needs 30 years ago were very different than what your needs are today how can we provide you with better services so mm -hmm. so you know I, I think that the fans will come to love it um, the great thing about our business and the proof will be in the pudding in a bad year we renew 80 percent or more of our tickets. Mm -hmm. In great years, we have backlog, we have 100% renewals mm -hmm. and people on a waiting list. Yeah. And so we haven't had cancellations, you know, it's five years from now, yeah. four years from now. So when I hear your fans are really, really upset, I have to say, well, I'd like to speak to them. Um, and are they our customers? Are they really fans or are they people on social media? Mm -hmm. If they're a fan, they're, um, they live in the area, mm -hmm. I, I will listen to them. I'll exchange emails with them. Yeah. If you're on social media and you're in another country and you're just a part of the community that's feeling good about venting, I'll read it, but I probably won't internalize it yeah. as much. And I have two, two more quick questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, then let me get yeah. uh, one more quick question. Then I guess uh, you know when you see you have a lot of people look at the landscape of you know sports arenas that they you know every so often you get you know new arenas here and there. Not necessarily in, in your case, but you know what would your response be to someone who said, "What's stopping you from doing this twenty five years from now to uh, another move, another uh, uh, new stadium?" Well, it'll be a thirty five year arrangement. Mm -hmm. And in 35 years, we would have to look at what happens. We will have paid it off, right? And, but 
I think the idea behind going there is the optionality to have more room to build up, to build down. I'd like to build up here. Mm. What, why can't we add floors here? Well, you can't. Um, the limitations in Washington, D.C. are self-evident. The limitations out there, there's just more optionality. And also in the deal, we have a big budget to every year be renewing, rejuvenating, keeping it fresh. Here, in the last 10 years, I've spent over $200 million in investments in the building, more than what it costs to build the building. Um, this will be, I think, the first building that was um, looked at, designed on a platform on AI, using new technology, new materials. I'm very, very excited about um, you know, the future and how technology is helping to create um, just big breakthroughs in things. It doesn't have to be you know, brick and concrete, it can be new materials. And these materials can be more easily replaced. You can um, use glass, you can use um, um, new design techniques. And we're going to really, really emphasize what the world looks like in 30 years. And you know that's what's exciting about this. We want to be known as the innovator in sports and technology. We have been first in esports, first in in-house sports gaming, uh, first to um, do paperless ticketing. Um, we want to make that experience for the fans in the new building, you know, on steroids uh, or on supercharge. <laughs> we we want from the time you leave to the time you're going home, for there to be no impediments for ordering, for viewing. Um, and, and so the, the opportunity to do new and innovative things is much more available to us. And that's the compelling reason that we want to go. It's nothing wrong with DC. It's just this once in a generation opportunity to be in 70 acres next to Amazon, right across the street from the airport, right on a new metro stop, Virginia Tech, Boeing, right, all right there. So I, I think it'll be great, but I understand the skepticism or the, the angst around change. But when you're an entrepreneur, you have to take those risks. You, you can't grow and embrace the future by saying, well, I, I don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable. I, I want things to stay exactly as they are. If you stay exactly the way you are in today's economy, you'll be going backwards very quickly. Excellent. Mr. Lance, thank you so thank much. You.